right, well, hi everybody. Um, I have uh, a couple of slides here to uh, give you a little bit of a background about what the course was about and how we went about designing it. And then uh, the rest of the team members will tell you more about their uh, role in the course and their uh, contribution to, uh, to, the, to the course and how the course came about and uh, how uh, we made it all, ha all happen. Um, so uh, does everyone know what, what a MOOC is and has everyone tried one and taken one? Yeah, okay, good. So you, you, you know that it's a massive on open online course and uh, it's very similar to regular online courses. The only difference is that it's uh, uh, open to anyone who wants to take it, so which, which uh, results in a, often in a massive uh, number of people taking it. And uh, that sometimes, you know, uh, has uh, some uh, considerations uh, in the design uh, of the course, and the course needs to be a, a little bit more more automated, and there's less interaction, direct interaction between between the instructors and the students because of the uh, difficulty of of managing so, so many uh, students. So uh, we. Uh, weren't so focused on the massive scale. I mean, we did, we did want to uh, open the course to as many uh, people a as we could, but uh, our main focus was to, to make it free and to uh, keep it online uh, as, an, as a convenience of, uh, of, 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 of delivery. Uh, so the course that, that we made uh, is called Course and Communities. And you'll find, uh, you'll find it at the URL shown on, on the screen, uh, sfe.coursize.com. And it's, uh, it's one of the, the two uh, massive open, open online courses that we uh, produced here at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, as, as Mark uh, introduced, uh, the, the main team members uh, responsible for the development of this, this course were Anna Maria, who was the, the course visionary. The idea for the MOOC uh, for the course came from her, so uh, she'll tell us more about how that came about and what that means for, for the School for the Environment. Then we have Dennis, who was a, a very important uh, player in the, in the team. He was the main uh, subject matter expert and also uh, the teaching assistant, and he helped uh, me as the instructional designer to make sense of all the scientific content that uh, I had no, no knowledge of because I don't have a background in, in environmental science. He also uh, helped the video editing team uh, with uh, making sense of all the video footage that uh, we had captured and uh, helping both of us and how to put that uh, together in context uh, in the course. Uh, so pretty much he was the, the science translator for us. Uh, he also, uh, so he had multiple <laughs> roles as you can see, and he also was the course facilitator uh, when, we, when the course uh, started, and uh, he, he managed the discussion boards and, and all that, and he also uh, recorded uh, some lectures as well. After that we have Alan, who is the project coordinator, and as the director of the Center for um, Excellency uh, Center for Innovation and Excellency in e-learning. Uh, he uh, was responsible for uh, putting uh, the team together uh, to to make this course happen, and also making sure that uh, everybody's happy in the team. <laughs> and so he'll he'll tell us uh, more more about the CIE role in this and uh, his his side of things. And uh, after Alan, we have Kevin, uh, who was the the lead uh, videographer responsible for capturing uh, all the beautiful video that you will see later that we have uh, in the course. Um, and uh, we were very, very lucky to have uh, uh, Kevin in the team, uh, even though now he has moved on to another role at another university, so um, it's our loss, <laughs> but we, we still have his, uh, his video uh, to, to work with. And, uh, we also have Jessica Downa, who is also an important uh, member of our, our team, but she's not here. Uh, uh, she had to go on vacation in Europe, unfortunately, but uh, we, we've excused her. <laughs> she really felt it was that unfortunate. 
<laughs> yeah. And then, uh, along with Jessica, Luis, uh, who's, uh, who is here, uh, is our other uh, video guru, and uh, uh, Luis and Jessica are uh, the, the, the main uh, video uh, editors in the course at the moment. And I'm the instruction designer. Um, so the, the course goal, just to give you some background, uh, and Ana Maria will, will talk more about this later, is that um, uh, it was, uh, the, the course goal was to show a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach uh, of uh, complex interactions between coastal systems and humans. Uh, and it was. Uh, it still is an introductory uh, overview to coastal environmental science. And uh, the main point was to engage the local and global coastal communities and to, to bring them all together uh, to, to discuss the issues that our uh, are, are, are Earth is dealing with. And uh, also to reach out to potential uh, School for the Environment uh, students. Uh, we have two offering of the course. We had the first one in the fall of 2013, and the second one we are working on uh, currently, and uh, that is to be delivered in a, a summer semester of uh, this year, and it starts on July uh, 14th. And you're all welcome to enroll it. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the, the first offering of the course was five weeks long. It was a no-credit course, and uh, we ran it in uh, the Core Sites LMS, which is the, the free, uh, free version of, of Blackboard Learn, and which is a system that we have here. Um, and uh, it, it, it also served as a, as a way to, uh, to show the, any potential students uh, the environment that we use here at, at UMass if they, they do decide to enroll here later. So uh, the course also played, played the role of a, of a demo course. Uh, we had, in the first offering of the course, we had 80 participants. So not, not as massive as we're used to seeing in, in MOOCs with uh, big uh, MOOC providers, but it was you know, big, big for, for us. Uh, we had participants uh, from far away, from as far as uh, Australia and, and Greece and Algeria. Uh, we, we ran several surveys, um, and according to, to uh, those responses, uh, most, most uh, participants were community members concerned about the environment. Uh, most of them were already had an environmental science degrees, and uh, the last number of them, 29%, uh, were uh, people who were interested in pursuing an environmental science degree, so uh, potential students for, for our school. Uh, out of all of these, uh, only six participants completed the course, uh, which comes down to about 4.8%, uh, which is somewhat in line with the completion rate of big uh, MOOC providers, edX and Coursera. I think it's, it's about 5% or two. Uh, so we weren't. Uh, much behind in that respect. Um, just to show you a, a map of where our participants came from, it's important to note that, uh, and Ana Maria might, might have more to say about this, but most of the participants from, the, from Massachusetts were, you know, people who, who live uh, on the coast, and a lot of them in the Quincy area. <laughs> so not sure, not sure where that was. So. Well, I live in Quincy. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> how did they? How do they know about it? Um, we did ask them in our survey as well. Uh, most people find out from the internet, from. Open Culture. There's a there's a website that uh, uh, aggregates uh, MOOCs that, uh, that that happen and sends out a, a regular uh, update about that. And uh, also, also course sites uh, 
the platform that we use, they have uh, a rich uh, MOOC catalog, and that's also easy to find. So some, some of the people found it there, but some, some in open culture, some on our website. So uh, you know, we try to spread the word uh, through, uh, through the open uh, advertising as much as we could. Um, OK. OK, so the course format was, uh, it was a pretty basic MOOC design. Um, we, had, uh, we had brief video lectures that were filmed in various locations in Massachusetts, uh, followed by practice quizzes and tests, and optional discussion participation. Then uh, we had the video lectures introduced the topic, and then we had uh, uh, supplementary reading materials, and we, we tried to uh, find uh, materials that were already on the internet as open resources. Uh, we didn't have a textbook or anything, so we tried to uh, use only materials that were uh, clearly free, and we don't, didn't want to you know, infringe upon any copyright issues or anything. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we had assignments for extra points from time to time. Um, we try to be a little creative in our, in our delivery, but uh, most of it was pretty basic design that we're used to seeing with a big uh, MOOC provider. So lecture, uh, discussion, and quizzes. And all of this would result in a certificate of completion uh, <coughs> that we uh, delivered using uh, the achievements tool in Core Sites, which is pretty much a built-in uh, Mozilla Open Badges uh, tool. OK, so it took, it took a, a lot of people to make this course. As you can see, our team is pretty big and diverse. And in, in addition to, to our team, uh, we also, <laughs> and Ana Maria will talk more about uh, all the instructors, because uh, she, she, she found all, all of them and asked them to participate in the course. <laughs> so uh, we had six, well, uh, five primary instructors and Dennis as our subject matter experts who were responsible for putting together uh, most of the, the content. Then in addition, we had uh, guest lecturers, uh, PhD students, um, a climate expert, Chris Watson, uh, Julie Wood from the Charles River Watershed Association, uh, Mark, Dave, and Phil from the National Park Service, who were, uh, gave a, a great contribution to our course, as well as Kurt Felix, who is a, a, a colleague of, of Ana Maria, and he's a, a renewable energy entrepreneur, <laughs> pretty much. Yes, from, from the town of Wellfleet. Um, OK, so we, we did a lot of filming. And Kevin can, can talk more about this, which was you know, a lot of work, but it was also you know, the, the beauty of working with a, a course that deals with the environment is that we get to spent a lot of time outside. And it was summer, so uh, we got to take some, some beautiful uh, videos and, and pictures. And, and I think it, it benefited the, the, the course content very well. Uh, OK, so these are, this is a map of the locations where we shot most of the lectures. And um, I can give a, a quick course tour if we're um, OK on time. OK, so all right. OK, I already have you open. Uh, so just to show you the layout of the course, uh, Blackboard and course sites is uh, sometimes is not the easiest to navigate. It kind of has multiple, it takes multiple steps and multiple clicks to get to the content. So we kind of try to work around around it by just embedding the video in a in an item, and then uh, pasting the additional readings uh, to the right of the video. So making little small learning modules within. On the on the on this main page, rather than separating separating them into different pages and having to click multiple times. Um, 
So the videos can be played directly from here. And just to show you quickly the... Because the oyster reefs here. are one of the most endangered habitats in the world. There are only between 5 and 10 percent of oyster reefs left in the world. And New England and this whole area were used... Uh, when uh, Native Americans used to live here, they used to walk on oyster reefs between the islands that you learned about. There are around 34 islands in Boston Harbor. Why, why do I love oysters and why do I think that you should learn more about oysters? They're amazing creatures that have been living here for hundreds of millions of years. We all, we all they evolved different uh, uh, changes and, and... Okay, so that, that gives you an idea and you can always you know, join our course to view more lectures. But uh, so just, just to give you an idea of some of the open educational resources that we used to complement lectures, this is, I think, is a, a good uh, interactive uh, video here. It's pretty cool. Um, okay. Okay, some, some feedback that we got from the course that we are taking seriously and are going to consider for uh, the next offering of the course is that uh, it was mostly positive. The only constructive feedback that we got uh, was regarding the use of discussion boards. Uh, people want those made uh, mandatory so that there is more participation there. Because it was optional in the course, people didn't really feel like they, they have to participate and then, you know, it, it resulted in not a very, not as interactive course as it could have been with 80 partic participants. But that's also you know, difficult to realize because uh, someone needs to monitor those <laughs> discussions and uh, it, it's a lot of work. So. Um, okay, so one uh, resource that we created as an open education resource from the videos that we put together is uh, this map. That should be loading anytime. And this is this can be viewed independently from the course. Uh, people don't need to be enrolled in it to view. But what it does is that. It gives a list of uh, videos uh, filmed in the, the various locations that, that we filmed the lectures. And it, it plays, it plays the, the video in that particular location. So it can be a, you know, a brief informational Watersheds are areas on the uh, across the land in which water flows and goes into a receiving water body. These watersheds can be pro close and proximate. So that's just to give you an idea. And so just a few words about the next course, uh, next running of the course. It starts on July 14th till the 20, uh, August 21st. Uh, the, the one uh, new component of the course is that we're going to add a, a laboratory component uh, and uh, it's going to have one credit. Uh, so in, uh, it's going to be uh, targeted towards AP students and um, so we're hoping to attract more students for, uh, for the program that way. And uh, this time we had more time uh, to promote the course because the first time we were kind of in a crunch time and that, that, that may also have resulted in uh, not as, as many participants. But this time we're promoting uh, wide and we're hoping to have more people enrolled and we already have 24 enro enrollees uh, uh, so far. Uh, we're going to also diversify the assessment taking into account uh, the uh, feedback that we got we're going to try and make the discussion participation mandatory, and we're also going to use more open badges 
uh, to uh, for, for the the lab components we're going to have at least six lab components and so that should make the, the assessment a little more more exciting uh, for for our participants okay so next up we have Anna Maria the course visionary yes and she's going to tell us shift to that um, a list of uh, five topics that you just had before yeah uh, where yeah the map yes that's fine this is fine yeah so thank you so much for Zerta. I will try to be very short uh, when um, Robin Hannigan my boss asked me would you like to do MOOC and you and she usually she's so wonderful she gives me an open hand to do it my way and when I said yes, I didn't really realize how much work that is in addition to everything else that I was doing. So it was like something that was a huge amount of work, but I'm telling you I would do it all over again for free uh, just because I worked with the best team ever. So it's just unbelievable how this whole team worked together without being a boss or not boss. We would just like, we just melted. and and. And to me, that was just like I was learning from them. They were appreciating my crazy ideas and trying to make them come true. <laughs> so it was just like, I don't know, uh, you will hear from them uh, later. But you know, when I uh, tried to um, design a course that will not be boring and that will constantly be outside and tell a story, tell a story about how science is important and how complex it is, and how do we actually tell the story in, in our little cove, in your little channel, in your backyard. How do you interact your, your lifestyle? And everybody's talking about all this, you know, doomsday and how bad it is. I, we wanted to, I personally wanted to tell some kind of more like a optimistic, solution-based story that yes, we do have a serious issues, and, but we also have the solutions for that. And I think that optimism and work that we actually created really brought out a pretty good course that we haven't seen, and I, I haven't seen so many courses that are all filmed outside. Nothing was filmed inside. We didn't have a course, you know, with a blackboard and everything, although we are now trying to, to, to uh, do that component. But um, it was a very um, nice learning story. Uh, to basically, uh, it, w it was the concept that I had in my head was like, okay, if I'm living in certain area, what do I want to know about that area? What does the scientist or faculty, that's why this whole component of having uh, the graduate student, uh, the faculty that I uh, basically successfully convinced to participate in there, like, because this was all at, in addition to their work. So I would like to, to thank, uh, you know, all of my colleagues and Robin Hannigan and her students and her husband, um, Alan Christian and uh, um, uh, Beth, Sarah, Sarah um, that actually uh, helped film uh, in their spare time because it's not like, you know, we're not actors. I, I, hate looking myself or listening to myself and then you have to come in front of the camera and you're like there eh, what do I say <laughs> so we learned from that that we need to really prepare the scripts a little bit more better and more concise so that uh, uh, we can all uh, work and Alan will talk about that because he's been wonderful in, in preparing certain scripts as an intros to every week that we had uh, so I would uh, not take too much of your time here uh, me talking, I want you to hear uh, about people who really did amazing work and we had meetings, but, you know, I feel like I had some crazy ideas or we worked hard, but they really did it. So, I mean, it was just like a teamwork without the hierarchy and the hierarchy was actually established when it was needed that somebody steps in and said like, okay, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> so it's just like, it was, it was a wonderful melt pot that I appreciate working with and Jessica is not here but she's been uh, awesome you know when suddenly everything is lost that she worked on and I'm like oh, really <laughs> so you know it's just like nobody really panicked too much we just all come down uh, had a beer and let's go on just joking 
<laughs> so uh, th the story that actually just to tell you is those five weeks had each week had a story and a topic like the natural uh, the, the natural history of your place um, the social history of your place what are the issues so that every person in Australia or in in Croatia wherever can actually relate to the topic and uh, so those are the topics that we try to say natural history human history of your place so it's not my place it's your place uh, how, how healthy is your living environment where do you live so they had to a little bit examine that and how can we adapt to climate change that everybody's talking about we don't want to talk about how we have a doomsday around us but what's the solution how, what can we do where the and also how can we scale that because everybody's talking about a global case I want to know what's going to happen in my cove and this is where people get that fear traction and it's more like okay delete too dangerous ah, and it doesn't make me happy delete so people really delete stuff that makes them uncomfortable so we would like to bring environmental issues to people that they can feel a little bit more uh, comfortable optimistic and that there are solutions so that was the whole goal of that so what I learned also from this first uh, course is that the second course where we are offering a credit of course again I said to Robin Hannigan yes I don't know why, <laughs> but it's just like, you know, because it's a challenge because, and also I'm working with the same team. So we are adding a lab component with the one credit. And uh, uh, what I think the suggestion, what I wanted to bring here is I want more graduate students involved and engaged in this. So each week, they will have six weeks. Each week will actually, and lab will be led by graduate students. Because I think uh, people are tired of, faculty, research, eh, let's just see the next generation, a little bit more enthusiasm, a little bit more energy. So I think that that's something to think about. But the complexity and different staff to have is very important. So I thank them again. They were awesome. Thank you. That's me. So I guess I'll, the three things I want to focus on, what my role was with the course, some of the challenges that I faced, and kind of moving forward and adding onto the previous pieces of what everyone was mentioning about with this new kind of running of it. So when I initially joined the course, to be honest, I didn't know what a MOOC was. Um, it was a new concept to me. Uh, but coming into the, the school, I was just open and really accepting to whatever opportunities that I could be provided with. Um, but don't get me wrong, it was a really exciting thing to be a part of. Um, I was able to convey and share certain aspects of my past experience and education, which my background is more ecology and environmental science based, as you could probably assume working under Anna Maria. Um, and it was really exciting because it was a very creative and flexible environment that I was able to really play with. So really having free reign with the research, um, seeing what I thought would be most important to implement within the course, um, again, just you know, having that degree of creativity, just trying to build something that isn't so cut and dry. Um, and at first glance, primarily, I was helping with the redesign of the existing sections from previous lecturers, the, um, from Beth, Sarah, and Maria, and so on and helping identify new pieces of course content that I think would nicely complement everything else, such as um, I added some lectures from the University of Edinburgh, where I did my undergrad, with um, climate Scientologists, people trying to debunk um, climate change skeptics. So a lot of things that I thought could really help uh, teach the participants in our community. Um, I took the materials I already developed as well and provided other pieces that we could use towards quiz sections because as Rosario mentioned that's an important component um, in having some degree of assessment for the students and I guess one of the more time consuming time consuming pieces was developing these other pieces of course content redefining things redeveloping it trying to make it fit more so the students involved could conceptually understand what we're trying to put forward um, and there's a lot of digging into the materials and literature as well. Again, you know, having that degree of free reign was 
difficult in that sense because I didn't really know exactly what I, I had an idea what I wanted to incorporate, but I had to make sure that it was, you know, it was right. So not kind of having that hierarchy, uh, as Anne-Marie mentioned, like, who do I go to to see, you know, does this work? But, you know, in the end, kind of just working with one another, it flowed pretty damn well. <laughs> um, so just other general TA duties, kind of being the facilitator, the cyber middleman between the participants and the overall course. So if they had any questions, they would come to me. Um, if I couldn't answer directly, I would go to Anne Maria, and so on and so forth. So going one step further, the kind of thought that I had leading into it was really let education guide itself, um, more so just as we're developing, as we're putting together the course, just let everything flow. Um, and again, steer away from the dry cut and paste um, old structure of education, how everything is just kind of taught to you and you're expected to regurgitate it back as in the form of an exam, a paper, and so on. And it's not ideal, nor is it practical. It's really teaching just the way of trying to, you know, has that um, regurgitation of material. So in my experience, the courses that stuck with me the most <coughs> were the ones that I didn't have a book to follow, um, had real engaging professors who were literally jumping up and down on stage without shoes. Um, so I guess to kind of put into context, I went to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, and the way that their structure works is there's, for one course, there's not just one teacher. There's five, six, seven, each one who's an expert in their given field. So they're not coming through trying to just scrape the surface of what they think is important for this overall course. They're coming in, they're really showing what their current research is, and it makes the students a lot more engaged. Um, and I believe that it was in important in incorporating similar design in the coasting communities. So when I was trying to piece together the, um, the content, I wanted to, again, have that degree of um, something to be more motivating or just informative than just the dry cut and paste. So it allowed it to be more fluid and flexible. So some of the challenges that we faced, or that I faced, was being the middleman, again, between the course experts and the design team. So trying to bring things from a scientific perspective and to convey that same information to uh, the video editors, Rosarda, so on and so forth. Um, it was a challenge to create and manipulate the lessons to better fit our overall objectives. And especially being that I just jumped into the project really in September. Um, when they were already doing filming throughout the course of the summer. And going on what I said before about making the content as engaging as possible, uh, it was difficult to find a nice balance between uh, informative and interesting. And students always tend to ask, why are we learning this? How are we going to apply this? So trying to answer those questions while developing the course I thought was um, a pretty useful thing, but a challenge nonetheless. And also with the degree of the impersonal sense of the online community, that's why we wanted to look at developing the discussion boards more, having it not as mandatory, um, trying to really get the students to interact with one another, because essentially they're just going to be on the computer. Is there going to be much overlap? Not necessarily if it's not mandatory. So that's what we want to develop for the um, next running of the course. So down the road, as we kind of alluded to, we've begun to we've begun the process to further develop the course for credits, mainly looking at the Massachusetts students in high school who've taken the AP Environmental Science exam. Um, so coming into a university setting, a lot of them aren't necessarily able to gain credit. Um, so we already have two introductory courses, uh, the EOS 120 and 121. The 121 is the lab component that is offered for entering uh, students in the SFE. And we're trying to use our platform and incorporate the lab components to provide them, coupled with their AP Environmental Science um, scores, to get credit with the School for the Environment. So it's both attractive for the students because they gain credit, 
and it's attractive for the university because it helps expand their student pool. So in order to achieve this, we had to do uh, two things. We had to establish a better degree of outreach, and we had to implement the bits from the 121 course to fulfill the course requirements. We promoted the outreach by creating a master list. I went into the Mass Department of Education website, um, did a bunch of clicking around, found the districts that taught or that offered the AP Environmental Science exam for 2013 and created a huge list of everyone to email, so the superintendents. And then with uh, Robin Hand Game, we just fired those out. So the districts represented 126 out of 525 total in AP Environmental Science students, over 2,000, and the average of the test per district is 25. And we didn't, out, we didn't reach out to every single district that offered it. A lot of them were, like, maybe one or two students took it as a kind of independent study. So we want to really aim at the, the chunk, the like, top 95% of districts. Um, and the second part was to help by recruiting the other TAs, the existing TAs who taught the 121 course to, our, to join our community. Um, it was important because they were responsive. We asked their opinions on what they thought worked and didn't work within the lab. So using their feedback, we were able to move forward and develop it so it could be a lot more interested in, and engaging for this uh, upcoming student pool. So one, like for example, the lab that I'm working on now, it's for estimating biodiversity. In the lab manual, it's kind of what you'd expect. Lab manual, you follow steps. There's introductory pieces. There's references to other sections. But to redesign that in the form of a script to allow students to become more engaged is a challenge that we're going to be looking at. So it's, it's presumably it's going to be a lot more interesting for them to work with. Yeah, everything's outside. So, yes. No, just the AP environmental. Oh, How many staff yeah. for the AP within a given district? Yeah, I just took all the districts that we had and just found an average between all those. Anyway, I'll pass it on to Alan then. Thank you. Um, some things that I want to pick up on. Um, this notion that there wasn't a hierarchy, or, and I think it was Anna Maria who spoke about it. It wasn't that there wasn't ever a hierarchy, it was a very flexible hierarchy. So, although in general, Rosarta really was leading this team um, th from start to finish, there were times when any one of the video editors or video producer uh, was supreme and everybody was reporting to him or to her because that was the focus of that moment and sometimes it could be because oh my god a, a critical video went down and we've got to rebuild it we got to get all the b-roll assets back or something else anything could could cause that to occur i had a very important role in the first running of the course in a really managerial way and a lot of that was acquisitions how many hard drives do we need to be sure that we always have a backup? How many um, different kinds of microphones do we need? How many cameras? This, this kind of thing. My role in this second working of the MOOC is very, very different. One thing I will say, uh, we, you just heard from Denise, who's our subject matter expert. We've now done completely, from start to finish, two MOOCs with primary members of this team. The first one we did with the physics department, we did not have a subject matter expert. It was horrific. If you ever go into producing a MOOC with, and you're promised a subject matter expert and that subject matter expert does not materialize, get out of the MOOC. Um, it, it's a really bad situation because when you are working outside of your area of expertise and stretching all of your design capabilities at the same time, um, it, the, the amount of time on task you spend is completely untenable. Uh, we didn't really hit on this uh, fully, but if you put together something that Anna Maria said, there are five topics that were
themes, and each week had its own topic theme. And for that week, we pulled from video and instruction based on any number of the five sites that applied. But the organization was the theme. Whereas Rizarta has taken a map, and she's rolled that around. The, if you look at the map, the organizing structure is the place, and then the number of topics come off of that. So that was a really strategic post first run of the course design that Rosarta came up with uh, and probably would have done it during the course if she had had time. Um, and that's an instance where we actually pulled in a web designer who was working on another project of the centers, a learning analytics project, who happened to already be on the payroll at UMass Boston as a part-timer. And so we were able to pull in that expertise. But one of the most important things is that we have had as few as three of us on a team at one time. We've had people come and go. So there ha it's had to be a very, very flexible uh, staffing situation and collaboration situation. Uh, the, the first run of the course was five weeks. The second now to get in the lab components, um, six weeks. And I think that's all I wanted to go at here. Now, I'm to address why bother. Why bother from the point of view of the center? Why bother from the point of view of the College of Advancing and Professional Studies, which supports the center and which supports online programming here at UMass Boston? And um, CAPS is a college with degree granting authority. But I think what's more important in this regard is that CAPS is a college which collaborates with other colleges of the university to meet key university strategic goals, including the goals of outreach and awareness of the excellence of the university at large and particular programs within the university. And if you want to see a, a website of the, of the um, center that I run, you can get there. We promote and encourage and sponsor the study of e-learning um, in its many forms across multiple sectors. All right, so this was all brand new to us. Well, no, it wasn't really all brand new to us because I come from a, a video production center, <clears throat> a staff member of a video production center across the hall from here run by those of you from UMass Boston know John Jesso. And when I got here in 1996, I believe it was, it was to work with John Jesso and uh, another individual in a triumvirate under a department or a program called multi-site education or MUSE. And for all those many years, for five years, and this was before online existed, uh, we were doing distance education as outreach, primarily to the K-12 community. And we were doing broadcast, live broadcast video and integrating it with pre-recorded material. Um, we were using a then quasi-public, now defunct, Massachusetts Corporation for Educational Telecommunications. We're also cable casting it into uh, our programming into the uh, Boston Public Schools because we were on the same cable network, the same private um, public cable network. Uh, we were adding to that CUC Me because that at the time was a Mac only but the only video conferencing tool that was readily available as a VoIP tool. And we added to that telephone network so we weren't draining down the uh, bandwidth of CUCME. We're only using it for low quality video of who we were teaching to while they were seeing us at high quality. And then we were adding a, a course website and then communicating outside of that using listservs and news groups. And so what is it? Well, it's an LMS before the day of an LMS and with synchronous conferencing integrated into your use of an LMS. So that tells you a little bit about where UMass Boston's online program comes from and why we've evolved the way we did and why when it came to MOOCing and somebody came to me and I already knew that I had Kevin with whom I worked on the MUSE program and said, could you do a MOOC? The answer was, well, yeah, in a sense, we've done MOOC. So what's old is new again. Um, and why were we doing it then? Outreach, outreach, outreach. And this is before this term, open educational resource, existed. But there was Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and 
semi-isolated areas like Plymouth and the Gardner District. Uh, that should say Gardner, actually, not Gardner. <coughs> and we were working with, with those teachers, and in some cases teaching college level courses to advanced high school students. So what's new in MOOCs? Um, well, one thing is that CAPS went into it with the School for the Environment in, in 2013. And what was new in all of this is the School for the Environment's new way of approaching environmental science. And Anna Maria has spoken about that. Uh, at the same time, we were partnering with a college that had an intention to move its uh, for credit revenue courses online. And that's, they would naturally be partnering with us to do that. And so we wanted to help get their new branding. They had been a department with an acronym EOS. They had become School for the Environment with a different mission. And we were trying to help them brand as we were trying to help them get online. And they wanted and we wanted to showcase their very gifted faculty. And so this gave us an opportunity to do all of those things. So where does the community come in to this? Well, one, it's these, these two different colleges getting together. But it's also, uh, you saw a lot of community in the passing of the torch. One of the reasons, uh, one of the things that I would have done on the first MOOC was promote, promote, promote. Get on the radio, spam, tweet, everything. We had 80 people because in that month before we were going to go live, um, Kevin got a great job offer and moved off. Well, the way he and I had worked is I had been his grip carrying bags around. A lot of times, Rosarta had had her camera, so you get great stills of Rosarta's, and he shot great video. I didn't do a great job of logging the videos, because why did I need to? Because he was going to edit it. Well, when he left at that point, and there was still a lot of editing to do, Jessica and then Luis came in, and they're sort of looking at just raw footage, and Alan hadn't really logged it. So uh, I got burnt on that one, and I really did the team a, a disservice. Um, more community. We not only got to partner with the SFE, but they shared their SFE partnerships with us. And the, there's a list of some of them. Uh, and at each of the local sites, we did our best to create a local cohort, and that is something that we want to do better and better as this course is offered over and over again. And uh, the whole notion of the constructivist MOOC, of course, is about community. And we've created further community, as we're doing right now, we hope, with conference presentation and the dissemination of information. So why did the center itself get into it? Well, primarily it was, look, everybody's talking mook, 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 and we want to be able to talk mook, 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 but we really ought to walk the walk before we start talking the talk. So we did two extremely different MOOCs. One was an X MOOC, one was a C MOOC, uh, a lot of other kinds of differences that I won't go into because it's a different presentation. And these are the things that we really wanted to explore. Scalability of design, not because we think we're going to make a lot of money, and we do have to make money in our online program, but because we do want to understand how our other online programs scale, the ones that are revenue-driven. Uh, also, what is the role of the instruction of instructional video in online education? And believe it or not, in the last two years since we've been doing this, it's become obvious that having excellent integrated instructional video in your online courses, it's no longer the value added. It's the what separates you from Phoenix University, basically. Okay, that's it now. And it's really funny because we were saying two years ago, well, that's why you got to buy a $10,000 camera. 5,000? Probably 5,000. Right, right, right. Um, also, it has really helped us poke at uh, learning how to design for mobile applications. A year ago, the center ran a uh, public forum on the sustainability of MOOCs where we all sort of sat around and said, okay, how do you on this? And we all agreed we don't quite know yet. And that was before the advent of all the promising attempts that have kind of failed in the big MOOC industry that's out there. So we had, you know, we had a, a good go of it. Well, let's talk about some of the ways that we think, I wonder if I did this on this slide. Yeah. Here's what we saw and stumbled onto it. We had this five-week course. We thought it would be really cool to try to offer it for 
as a three credit course. So we looked at the three credit introductory environmental science course and we played with that for a while. And quickly it became obvious the real overlap is not with the three credit introductory environmental science class. It's with the lab that's attached to the three credit environmental science class. What we were going to do is add the five week course and make it a blended course and do two weeks on ground with students this summer, one week blended. And then ultimately we would add more video and make it maybe two thirds online, one third on ground. And we'd be able to mix and match that over time and we could make it a fully online three credit at some point. of your material in the can and then schedule the first running of the course. It don't have an open course that's really publicly out there and say, we're going to launch it on this date. Put it in the can and then say, here's what it is. Here's the audience. Now, we thought we might launch it on this date, but they don't at that particular audience, it turns out, doesn't take courses in the summer. So we're not going to do it till the fall. But it's already done and you're not under pressure to do it. Um, so we stumbled on the fact that in School for the Environment, you can enter with three of the four credits you need to be a major if you pass the AP Environmental Science exam with, I assume it's with a four or a five. I don't know how the SFE, I don't know how School for the Environment says it, but most colleges, it's if you get a four or five on the AP, you get um, credits. And they credit that as their intro environmental. But the intro environmental in order to become a major also requires a lab. And the AP Environmental Science doesn't have a lab. And we go, oh man, this is fabulous. Also, SFE can't offer labs enough for, for non-majors who want an environmental science lab for other reasons in the university. And many of those people want to take it online. So we've got this natural for that. Now, Uh, if you don't come into the School for the Environment with your one credit, it's entirely likely that you can take some kind of four credit compendium into some other school. Well, like what other schools? As it happens, in the Commonwealth, there's four schools that are in regular communications with the School for the Environment. Each of them has or is trying to develop its own environmental science program. And a lot of them don't have enough classes and in many cases not enough labs. So this may be a boon for them, and particularly if we get a three credit fully online version of the intro. Again, stumbled on it more than anything else, but it may answer. One thing to make very clear, this is still an open course. That is, anyone can take this course, not for one credit, which costs a little under $400. So we're talking about it being a one credit course. It is you can take it as an option as a one credit course. You can also continue to take it as an open course and a sheet of labs if you're not really interested in them and not really good with the course. And there's Kevin. Take it away, Kevin. I will. As Alan has mentioned, Alan and I had worked be together before. And uh, when he asked me if I was interested in working with him again, I don't know why I said I would, but I did. Um, we had worked previously on another MOOC uh, last year, which was uh, Molecular Dynamics. And uh, Rosada, uh, Alan, and myself almost lost our minds. Um, and then we had this MOOC that we were hit with. and. Um, we were told that we were going to start shooting in May, and we needed it done by September. And I wanted to kill you. Um, so we had a fair amount of work to do. And the difference was that when we were shooting the Molecular Dyna Dynamics MOOC, the video that was being utilized was shot in a studio. So it was very controlled. Um, we didn't have to worry too much about it if there was a, a blown line Alan was talking about logging. We can make a notation of that. It was fairly straightforward as far as the editors were concerned. They could take it. They could cut it up. It wasn't a problem. The challenge we had was that we were going to be shooting outdoors. 
we were going to be shooting outdoors in the summertime. It brings to mind an expression by uh, a guy named uh, Noel Coward, only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Because, <clears throat> because what would happen is everybody wanted to shoot. Oh, let's have the shoot around 11 o'clock, and then we can go to lunch, and let's shoot at 1 o'clock. Because the tide is right. Well, the tide might be right, but the sun, but the sun is wrong. It's overhead. Um, it, it, it creates cast shadows. It's ugly. So they said, well, when do you want to shoot? I said, hmm, what time sun, ca sun come up? 5.45. That's a good time. I wasn't very popular. But that's what we started to do. We tried to shoot during what we call uh, the golden hours, which would be just around sunrise and just around sunset. And what it did was it produced very, very warm, vibrant light. And um, everybody looked great in the video. Okay? And there was a reason for that. When you create a video, and you want to market something, whether it be a MOOC or a product, you want it to be aesthetically pleasing. And when you produce it, you want it to be entertaining. You have to engage your audience. And then the other two things it has to be, it has to be educational and informative. And the last one is at some point it has to have some economic payoff. And hopefully what we did will have some economic payoff. But we were challenged with producing these videos, and we had to do it in an outside environment. We had to contend with airplanes, um, rain. In one particular case, Anna Maria and I went over to a place over in Medford, and um, we wanted to do a shot of a, of a dam. It was great. We had the shot lined up, but you know what? We had trains going by. We had a windmill that was making a lot of noise. And I had the microphone cranked, and no matter what the fellow that we were interviewing was saying, we couldn't hear him. So that, those were the types of challenges that we had. Um, <clears throat> best, the good part of it was we had some fun. We got to spend the better part of a week down in Nantucket. And um, geez, we didn't, have any, we didn't have a problem recruiting a crew for that one, did we? No. 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 So, so we went down to Nantucket. and. Um, Again, as you can see, that shot's probably very early in the morning. And um, typically what we would do is uh, we would sit down with the talent, that's the person in front of the camera, and try to find out what they wanted to talk about. It was very open. We didn't have a script. We may have had a sketch or an outline. And we would usually say to the talent, less is more. And they'd say, well, what do you mean? I, I don't need a 15-minute lecture. Give me your short version, preferably a minute to three minutes. Okay? Well, there was a reason for that. Obviously, I didn't want to have to do an awful lot of editing. I, I'd like to see if I could get it all in one take. And the other thing that we were doing is we were making mental notes while we were going along because we knew we had to shoot what we call B-roll, supporting video that would had to be used in order to cover this, edit it, and support it. So typically, in most cases, like in this particular case, we're at Folgers Brook, just down from the, uh, the center for, uh, that UMass has. And we're there at approximately 6.45 in the morning. And Alan and I had done a, what we call a site and survey the day before. And it picked out this spot because it was slightly elevated so that we could shoot down and, and, and get a good shot of the, the marsh and the, and the talent. And, um, well, you can't see me. I'm off over here. But you can see Jessica, who, who was working with me. And um, there's a reason why she's looking down this way. Because she's about to tell me that we're going to get hit by a car. <laughs> and that's the, reason why I actually, that's the reason why we had her there. It's like, you know, would you, if you see a car coming down the road and it looks like we're going to get hit, would you let me know? And I, I just said, okay, fine. Just, we'll just keep shooting. Wave at him. And she did, and the guy went by. So, and then um, we'd have to go in there, we'd have to set up, we'd have to set the camera up, we'd have to do an audio check. At that particular time, we didn't have a piece of wireless, uh, a wireless uh, microphone. So we had to physically lay cable out into the marsh <laughs> and, and mic the talent up. And then because there was so much poison ivy, we had to wipe 
Right, right. So that they were getting all And one of the things that's interesting is that we didn't have a makeup person, so our talent had to do, adjust their own hair. <laughs> and uh, we conducted this, and uh, she was actually testing for acidity in the water or whatever it was. And uh, she did it. She nailed it. She did it in about three minutes. It was a good take. And then, um, then we had a slight production meeting afterwards. Alan was asking me, did I think that I had enough in the can? Jessica's laughing because she's knowing what I'm going to say. And I'm going to ask him, where are we going for breakfast? Because I was hungry. OK. And um, what we'll do is we'll just take a look at actually what we shot there. It's a three-minute piece, but we'll look at about the first minute. Maybe we won't. Folgers Rosada. Marsh is a 17-acre salt marsh that's uh, in very good shape. Salt marshes have a freshwater input, and that's exactly where we're at. There's a cattail marsh across the street, and where I'm standing is where fresh water, which is water that's not salty, comes into the marsh. So the salinity here is about 8.8 .8 parts per thousand. Temperature is 19.6. And we've got more conductivity, because we're using a conductivity meter to tell us what the salinity is. All salt marshes have what's called, a, or most salt marshes have what's called a um, salt wedge, which is salt water that creeps up along the bottom and fresh water that floats along on the top. So fresh water comes from rivers and streams, floats along the top of a saltier wedge that's coming in from the ocean. On each tidal cycle, that ocean will push closer into the salt marsh, and on the ebb tide, Okay, I just wanted to briefly show you that. And now, one of the issues that we had, what you see in that video is, you see other images that are supporting the talent's narrative. And that was one of the things that we tried to do when we were going out there, was to try to shoot as much B-roll as we had in order to support the editing. And, uh, well, you can take it from there. So what I'm going to talk about is very briefly what, how I got involved in this project, uh, my main challenges in the project, and the things I learned in the project. So I moved to Boston in 2012. In 2012, according to the New York Times, was the year of the MOOC. Some people called it something else. <laughs> But the thing is that in before 2012, I was my background is in teaching. I moved from London. I was working at the King's College, and my background is in teaching. I started to make video lectures for my students. Then I started to help other colleagues to make video lectures, and eventually I got a full-time job to make video lectures. In 2012, I moved to Boston, and this is what I see in the news: uh, there is this big, new, exciting thing called MOOCs, and I think, hang on a second. I want to be part of it. <laughs> no, that sounds exciting. So I come to UMass Boston to talk about the Instructional Design Master's program. And Judith Erdman, who's not here today, put me in touch with Alan Girelli, who was at the time producing the MOOC. And for some reason, he got me involved in it. And I'm very grateful. So first of all, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jean. And thank you, Irene, for, for giving me this opportunity. Because it was really great. So. My main challenge, here we have a lovely oh, picture. <laughs> here we have a lovely picture of Anna Maria with some oysters. And my main job, because Kevin had left at that point, had other commitments, my main challenge was to, you, to put it all together. The problem was I have no clue about oysters. I mean, <laughs> other than they're tasty. And I didn't know any of these locations. So the first main challenge was, how do I make sense of this? So to do that, I had to work with this community of people, 
subject matter experts, video editors with Jessica, with instructional designers, and try to make videos uh, using B-roll or supplementary footage that would reinforce what the faculty were saying. That was um, the main challenge. Just very quickly, things that I learned. One thing that I think is very important, and I should mention this, is the importance of video in instructional, uh, instructional videos. It says that over seven point, this is according to a survey conducted by the Babson Survey Research Group. And this, this was an article that appeared on, the, on EduCase a couple of weeks ago. And it says that over 7.1 million students took at least one online course. And video is very often a key component of online courses. This applies, of course, to MOOCs. Why? Well, as you probably agree, videos have the ability to convey a multi-sensory learning environment. And now if you're thinking of making your own MOOC, some tips also from learning analytics, this time in a student survey conducted by the University of Columbia, New York. Um, students have very high demands on video. You know, they, they make their own videos on their phones, and they make fantastic videos. So they won't just accept anything. They have to be well produced. As a student myself, I can appreciate a video that doesn't have much production, and the content is great. But there are subjects, like for example this one, where really having multimedia, having information from, from the real world is important. And that has to be well done. Um, Another thing that the students appreciate is the fact that because online there is no interaction between the teacher and the student, when you show a teacher, that teacher has to somehow engage with, with you. So they appreciate if the language is conversational, if the, student, if the teachers use humor, and draw on past experience. They're telling you things that they won't find, find in the textbooks. Another thing is the use of multimedia. So use as much, as many resources as possible. Today is easy. There are free online pictures. There are TED Talks. There are YouTube videos. There are plenty of resources available to you. And finally, something, keep it short. You know, keep it short and sweet. Was it sweet and short? Short and sweet. Uh, okay. <laughs> It says that reproducing your 45-minute lecture online is never a good idea. So try to keep it. They talk about the four-minute viewing time. That seems to be the average. I think four minutes is a little too extreme. I think that under 10 minutes it's reasonable. But the thing is to keep it in mind. Keep it short and straight to the point. And finally, something that may contradict your intuitions and something that may contradict what we heard, heard over lunch today that mobile learning, at least as 2013, was not doing very well. Look at this. Most of the students watch the video lectures on a computer. Only 3% watch the lectures on a mobile phone or mobile device. Um, but my guess is that in, I wouldn't say five years, maybe two, <laughs> this will be completely different. Um, maybe the reason is that, as a student myself, I find it hard to watch the video lectures on a phone because sometimes you have to read the text and it's tiny. So maybe the, the point is that we as instructional designers, we should think about this. Think about all that commuting time that the students can use to watch your lectures. And that's all from me. Thank you very much.